Hi there, podcast listener. Whether it be the away team, the fine line, the truly pointless podcast, or a podcast idea that's floating in the back of your mind, you know what the most important thing you need to worry about is? No, it's not talent, because if that was the case, there would be few to no podcasts. It's hosting. And I'm here to tell you about Anchor. Let me explain why Anchor is the easiest way to start a podcast. First off, it's free. You can't go wrong with free. Maybe you don't know if this is something you want to do on the regular, or you want to start out with the least expensive option. Now, if you're not an old pro like us and don't have a full recording setup, Anchor has creation tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. They will even distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many others. Oh, and did I tell you you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership? They will set you up with sponsors, and you can make money by your fans simply listening to your ad. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I'm Stephen Vargas, and this is The Fine Line, a social commentary podcast that takes a look at the world around us and gives it some historical perspective. Remember, the truth you're searching for may not be the truth you're looking for. I want to thank you guys for joining us for the second episode of the How We Got Here series, a look at how an ultra-conservative senator from Arizona set the stage for a political party that would be behind the storming of our nation's capital. This week's episode is a building block to what led to the most politically polarized our nation has ever been. A small act by Ronald Reagan and the FCC would change the political landscape and give it the rise of a no-name political radio host, bringing the success of conservative talk radio and change the way we discuss politics in this country. There's a generation that hasn't known a time without Fox News. Oddly enough, there's also a generation that has no idea who Rush Limbaugh is or how you could even listen to him. Some have suggested, and rightly so, that if Rush or Fox News had been around in the early 70s, Richard Nixon would have never resigned. Now, there are many hypotheticals about that, too many alternate realities to discuss, and I don't I don't want to go down one of those many rabbit holes that I fell through on my own just thinking about that when I'm alone in the dark and the power's out. Now, we don't have time to unpack all that. That would be its own series. So let's pick up where we left off last time. Barry Goldwater shellacking at the hands of Lyndon Johnson took the Republican Party down a road they hadn't intended. They needed to rebuild the party. We can kind of gloss over the next several years to get to where we need to be. In 68, Johnson decided that he wasn't going to run for a second term as president. Richard Nixon decided to take on uh, the Democratic candidate, Hubert Humphrey, who was considered a Johnson lackey. The Vietnam War was in full effect. Crime was on the rise. Many in America didn't like the rise of the counterculture. Protests to end the war were on the nightly news, as was images of the war. Nixon ran on the law and order ticket and won the presidency. But due to Watergate, Nixon resigned and Gerald Ford took over the office. He had a bad time handling a recession and flip-flopped a lot. He lost re-election to former Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter in 1976. Carter had an even worse time than Ford, losing re-election to former California Governor Ronald Reagan in 1980. With hostages being held in Iran, high unemployment, and gas lines, Carter never stood a chance. Ronald Reagan himself was a neocon a neoconservative, a chip off the old block of Barry Goldwater. In fact, back in 1964, Reagan had endorsed Goldwater in a television televised endorsement. I asked to speak to you because I'm mad. 
I've known Barry Goldwater for a long time. When I hear people say he's impulsive and such nonsense, I boil over. Believe me, if it weren't for Barry keeping those boys in Washington on their toes, do you honestly think our national defense would be as strong as it is? And remember, when Barry talks about the way to keep the peace, when he says that only the strong can remain free, he knows what he's talking about. And I know the wonderful Goldwater family. Do you honestly believe that Barry wants his sons and daughters involved in a war? Do you think he wants his wife to be a wartime mother? Of course not. So join me, won't you? Let's get a real leader and not a power politician in the White House. Vote for Barry Goldwater. Now jump to 1987. We're one year away before the 1988 election and the end of Reagan's second term. On August 4th, 1987, before my freshman year of high school, Reagan appointed FCC Chairman Dennis R. Patrick to spearhead a four to nothing vote to abolish something many people didn't know called the Fairness Doctrine. So what is the Fairness Doctrine? The Federal Com- Communication Commission, also known as the FCC, had been tasked with issuing broadcast licenses to radio and television stations that operate in the, quote, public interest, convenience, and necessity. In 1949, the FCC issued a report that established the duty of broadcast licensees to cover controversial issues in a fair and balanced manner. That report became the Fairness Doctrine. It was a result of how the media was used for propaganda purposes during World War II. Its basic requirement were that broadcasters, quote, devote a reasonable portion of broadcast time to a discussion and consideration of controversial issues for public importance, of public importance, and affirmatively endeavor to make facilities available for the expression of contrasting viewpoints held by responsible elements with respect to the controversial issues. And that was per the report by the Congressional Research Service. In practice, it would require broadcasters to identify issues of public importance, decide to cover those issues, and then afford the best representatives of the opposing views on the issue the opportunity to present their case to the community, the report explains. But it also required broadcasters to allow individuals who were subject of editorials or personal attacks to be granted an opportunity to respond and establish that candidates of, for public office are entitled to equal airtime. And that was the becoming a rallying cry for many in the conservative corners. Conservatives wanted to do away with the Fairness Doctrine as they believed conservative viewpoints were being censored by the liberal media. See that thread there again. The first instance of c- cancel culture by conservatives. Now, this meant that anyone that was attacked or false accusations were made they had to give them equal time to address those accusations. Now, you can see the effect on the media today. Tribute Broadcasting, that was a heavy Trump backer, would run ads on their airwaves by their local television anchors to discuss fake news. You can also hear it in their continued rhetoric to galvanize the base to stymie any attempt to revive it, calling it government overreach. Are there any other questions, Senator Hutchinson? I do. Uh, I wanted to ask one last question. Uh, We talked in my office about the so-called fairness doctrine. And um, as I understood it, you said that you did not support reviving it uh, or uh, policies like it directly or indirectly through localism and that sort of thing. And I just wanted to have for the record that, that I am correct in... Uh, stating your position or if you would like to restate it. No, Senator, I I don't support reinstatement of the Fairness Doctrine. I uh, uh, believe strongly in the First Amendment. I don't think the FCC should be involved in censorship of content based on political speech or opinion. And the Fairness Doctrine. Senator Trent Lott last week said that talk shows are a problem and something needs to be done about them. And some senators are now talking about reviving the so-called Fairness Doctrine. And the Fairness Doctrine is where the federal government mandates speech on talk shows, private radio broadcasts. It's really important that Congress stay away from the Fairness Doctrine and scrap it because a free market of ideas is working and the federal government needs to stay out of talk shows. The crux of the issue was the First Amendment, which is something they love throwing around, not that many truly understand it. 
But the conservative viewpoint is that radio and television stations are private property. You lost yet? Well, let me explain. If someone buys a radio station, they own the building and the land it's on. Ergo, they can say whatever they want since they own the property, which is a very broad and loose interpretation of free speech. Unfortunately for anyone that plays a radio stereo, a loud stereo system too loud, they can be hit with those noise complaints. The other problem is that the FCC governs the airwaves. No one without a license from the FCC can start a radio station. And for those of you old enough, remember pirate radio stations? Yeah, you could broadcast without a license and you were shut down by the full force of the government. The debate over the requirement peaked in the mid-80s. Reagan appointed Patrick, who had worked on Reagan's 76 and 80 presidential campaigns, to find a way to abolish it. The FCC wrote a vote was opposed by members of Congress who said that the FCC had tried to flout the will of Congress and the decision was wrongheaded, misguided, and illogical. The decision drew political fire and cooperation with Congress was one issue. In June 1987, Congress attempted to preempt the FCC decision to codify the Fairness Doctrine, but the legislation was vetoed by President Reagan. There was worry that with the removal of the Fairness Doctrine, some television media wouldn't be so worried about offering a fair and balanced news. Here is the head of NBC News offering some insight as to what could happen if they repealed it. Uh, I think that the Fairness Doctrine articulates what we as broadcasters must do in order to hold a license. And that the basic issue is that we must be fair, that we must provide a forum. We are not a newspaper. We are not a magazine. We are a spectrum space allocated by the federal government. In exchange for that, I don't think that we as broadcasters have the right to go on and express our own views are the views of an individual party, our individual organization, individual special interest group, without providing the opportunity for others to have that same uh, right on the air. Now, there is a misconception on the left that reinstating the Fairness Doctrine would allow FCC to regulate and punish channels like Fox News or One America News. Unfortunately, the Fairness Doctrine is designed to only regulate broadcast radio and television. Cable isn't regulated with the same doctrine simply because, and this is true, you pay for cable, even though cable companies bundle channels together that you don't even want. So some of you are probably wondering what the fairness doctrine has to do with the riots at the Capitol. Only the constraints of the doctrine was were removed. Talk radio was allowed to do and say whatever they wanted with no constraints. Things are sounding a lot better for the 8,900 radio stations across the country. Less government hassle and red tape is a song they were playing this week as the FCC made some major changes in how radio stations are run. There are no longer limits on the number of commercials a station may play, and the restrictions were lifted from news and public service programming. The free market will now determine what a station plays. Will it make a difference in the sound of local radio? Overall, there will be some changes that will not be uh, negative at all. I think that uh, it's going to be a very positive move. Broadcasters, as a, as a general rule, are very responsible people. Most of them are uh, local citizens and uh, of a high caliber, and they, they have no intention of uh, uh, doing anything that uh, is going to shortchange the public. The repeal of the Fairness Doctrine was considered a saving grace for news radio, one such conservative that found this as his shining moment was Rush Limbaugh. We make the complex understandable, and we do it in a way that makes you love your country, not hate it. This college dropout started in radio, being a traditional DJ using names like Rusty Sharp or Jeff Christie. He was fired from all the radio stations he worked for. He eventually moved to Sacramento, California, and tried his hand at being a shock jock for conservative news with his own show on KFBK, The Rush Limbaugh Show. By August of 1988, his show went national and was broadcast through 56 stations. However, in 1987, after the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine, he could say whatever opinion he had without recourse. Unlike many other conservative radio personalities, he would broadcast for three hours during the day without the help of guests. He told the New York Times, I wanted to be the reason people listened. 
And that's how you pad your pocket. That's how you establish yourself. This, this is something the fairness doctrine was designed to control. Under the doctrine, he would have to have guests from either side and essentially debate the issues in a fair and balanced manner. However, without it, he could make the show about himself and only have himself to talk to. I believe you're starting to see where I'm going with this. Freedom is killed off by people claiming that the greater good or the general will or the betterment of the community requires speech patrol. By 1990, he had about 3 million listeners. This was establishing him as a major force on the right, bringing devoted listeners and saying things that many on the far right believed was true. And he would say outrageous things in the same vein as Howard Stern or Don Imus. Steinbrenner has passed away at age 80. That cracker made a lot of African-American millionaires. Many of his listeners considered him a person that isn't afraid to say what he felt. It's pretty obvious that many of his listeners thought the same things he said, and he even agreed with him. But they had to keep their mouth closed. During his radio show, he said some vile and racist things, to which many of his listeners found funny. And after his death, you would see many of his fans claim that he was a decent man and was never racist. He was always funny. To me, that says more about the person who believes, believes that than Rush himself. In one instance, he had to say he had this to say when a college student, Susan Fluke, testified before Congress on why health coverage should include birth control medication for women. What does it say about the college co-ed Susan Fluke, who goes before a congressional committee and essentially says that she must be paid to have sex? What does that make her? It makes her a slut, right? Makes her a prostitute. She wants to be paid to have sex. Ms. Fluke, and the rest of you feminazis, here's the deal. If we are going to pay for your contraceptives and thus pay for you to have sex, we want something for it. And I'll tell you what it is. We want you to post the videos online so we can all watch. At another time, he said, look, let me put it to you this way. The NFL all too often looks like a game between the Bloods and the Crips without any weapons. There, I said it. And he had this to say about two female Supreme Court justices' qualifications, or in his opinion, lack thereof. You know, you know, Rush, this thing about life experiences, it seems that this administration is putting life experiences over qualifications. I mean, it's ridiculous. Well, of course, wait, wait a second now, I'm not, don't, Bob, I'm not getting impatient with you, but of course, because Sotomayor is not qualified. Kagan is not qualified. The whole point of talking about life experiences, who we're talking about here? Sotomayor and Kagan, what are they? They're women. That means they're victims. That means they're minorities. That means they've been discriminated against. That means we owe them. Exactly. We owe them their life experiences. They've had it tough. They've had it so tough because they've been women in America. And they've been Hispanic women in America. And they've had to play softball as women in America. And it's really had a deck has been stacked against them. And because they've had to go through life eating excrement sandwiches every day because of Ronald Reagan and George Bush and Rush Limbaugh, they're owed a seat on the Supreme Court. Doesn't matter if they couldn't spell cat if you spotted them to see in the tea. He said at another time, the NAACP should have riot rehearsal. They should get a liquor store and practice robberies. Of course, there was this in reaction to Obama wanting to pay minority farmers who had been unfairly treated compared to white farmers. All right, here's this, uh, this lawsuit in a nutshell. Obama has offered black farmers a $1.25 billion class action award to settle claims of discrimination. It started after Reagan closed the USDA's civil rights office in, uh, in 1981. Uh, and he's offering women, Latino farmers, a similar settlement of $1.3 billion for the same thing. Uh, th th this, th th folks, this, this is just reparations you know, under a different name. That's uh, all this is. In 1992, then former President Ronald Reagan wrote him to declare him, quote, the number one voice for conservatism in our country. As his dominance grew, he was the kingmaker of the Republican Party. 
His views of conservative values led to the hard right. He started calling Democrats crazy left and socialists. It was noted that people who listened to his show for 10 hours or more would be more inclined to vote Republican in the next election. After the election of Bill Clinton, Limbaugh made it his personal mission to point out his impact towards Republicans. Newt Gingrich himself gave a lot of credit to Limbaugh for Republicans taking control of the House in 1994, which was the first time in four decades. Limbaugh considered himself first and foremost a businessman. In 2001, his radio show was syndicated to almost 600 stations by Premier Radio Networks in a nine-year deal that earned him about $200 million. Limbaugh wasn't without his issues, aside from the racism. He had checked himself into rehab to deal with the addiction to prescription pain medication that was after resigning in 2003 from ESPN for making racist comments about then-Philadelphia Eagles quarterback Donovan McNabb. I'm sorry to say this. I don't think he's been that good from the get-go. I think what we've had here is a little social concern in the NFL. I think the media has been very desirous that a black quarterback do well. He took five weeks off of his show. He never suffered any real repercussions from his drug use, even though he was investigated for doctor shopping, which is when a person goes to different doctors to get the same prescription multiple times. Plus, he had spoken on air about drug users needing to be punished, especially white drug users. In 2005, Limbaugh started seeding the mind of conservatives, which would lead to what became the Tea Party revolt. After some Republicans voted against oil drilling in the Arctic, he said on air, quote, There's no such thing as a moderate. A moderate is just a liberal disguise, and they are doing everything they can to derail the, co- the conservative agenda, end quote. Sounds like something Goldwater would have said. As his popularity grew, he began supporting QAnon theories. Not directly, but saying that there were possible voter fraud and the election machines were talked about extensively on his show. Being a science denier, saying secondhand smoke wasn't dangerous and it was all a myth, he even perpetuated the birtherism theory. In 2016, he neither attacked Trump, like many uh, in the conservative media did, but he didn't support him either. And this cost him dearly when Sean Hannity became the important radio host in America. However, once he was elected, Limbaugh was all in on Trump. We are all in for President Trump because he is all in for us. As the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine illustrated, it propelled the far-right conservative movement into high gear. Conservative radio programming grew at an exponential rate, giving the far-right conservative wing of the party a mouthpiece. Now, There's also that myth that conservatives are fighting being silenced. The liberal media is trying to silence them. And that is something Barry Goldwater charged in 1964. And it's something the right is using, uh, used to get rid of the fairness doctrine. And they're still using it today, saying that they are on the cusp of being silenced. Yet Fox News and One America News Network, Newsmax and other right wing news networks flourish. Go to any podcast app and see right-wing media flourishing in the top charts. With the strength of right-wing media, they circled their wagons around President Trump and kept a majority of the party behind him during impeachment, both times. Now I ask you, if all these mouthpieces were around during Watergate, would Nixon have resigned? As conservatism dominates the airwaves, there is still a missing piece, someone to take the momentum and push it over the finish line. Newt Gingrich heard the call aligning with Rush, and they came came back in force in 1994. And that's next time on The Fine Line. So thanks for joining me for this episode of The Fine Line with Stephen Vargas. New episodes drop every other Wednesday. If you would like to more content or to check out the other shows on the Lazy Geeks Network, you can head over to the blog, thelazygeeks.com. And if you like what you heard and would like to help us out, this way we can produce higher quality programming, you can donate to our PayPal account. Just head over to the blog and click on that donate button. And if you can't help us out monetarily, which we completely understand, you can help us out by rating or sharing the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you can. This helps raise our profile and we'll share our content with the world. 
You can also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Lazy Geeks. Or you can contact us by emailing me at themailbag at thelazygeeks.com. And if you would like to follow me personally, you can stalk me over there on Twitter and Instagram at the Gen underscore Xer. I also have a blog, which you're more than welcome to check out, thegenxer.com. So thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephen Vargas, and this was The Fine Line. <laughs>